Guide. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Jake Blanchard Podcast. Bill Lee joins me today. He's an American entrepreneur with 30 plus years of experience in the automotive space, as well as with startups. He had various roles at Ford Motor Company internationally, did some cool stuff around M&As, eventually was the founder and COO of Greenleaf, which became the second largest automotive recycler in the world. And at just 28 years old, he was the youngest senior executive at Ford. He's now the CEO of Nightscope, an innovation company that is disrupting the security, public safety, and crime-fighting landscape. Bill, welcome to the show, sir. Jake, thanks for having us. Greetings from uh, Silicon Valley. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm I'm in a little town outside of Boise, Idaho. So I, I live in, in kind of rural Idaho. And, and it's so interesting when I have folks like you that come on the show that are connected to these like large technology projects that are, um, you know, impacting cities and the world landscape. The, the rise of the robots happening and it's going to show up in Idaho as well. So no escaping it. No escaping it, man. When the, and that's what we're here to talk about. Um, hey, first off, I gave you a little bit of intro, hit the top of the waves on what I knew. Um, but you've got an impressive background, an impressive experience. Um, you know, what did I miss? How would you describe yourself uh, when, when coming on a show like this? What, what should the audience know a little bit about you before we get started? Uh, I think it goes for me and, and frankly, my team. Uh, relentless. Like, we don't like to answer no. If we decide that something is important and needs to get done, we will fight to the end to make sure we can force a victory. It may not be pretty. It may take too long, but we uh, eventually get there. And, you know, there's there's some lessons learned out of that, which I'm happy to share with the audience. But I think the word relentless probably comes to mind. I love it. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at your background right now for those that are listening to the show, as opposed to the the folks who join us on on YouTube or or other platforms where the video is available. You got some half stacks and some full stacks and some guitars behind you. Um, dude, I'd love to know a little bit about uh, why the music and why the Star Wars? Uh, the music is probably my only outlet. Like I, you know, not proud of this, but you know, work 60, 80, 100, 120 hour weeks. And sometimes you just need to pick up the ax and, and play a little uh, old school heavy metal. Yeah, and kind of get it out of your system. Uh, the Star Wars stuff to me, you know, it's science fiction. It's a huge influence on the company, but it's, you know, uh, always about the forces of evil and the forces of good. Um, and at Nightscope, we have this kind of crazy mission to see if we can make the U.S. the safest country in the world. Uh, so you've got the rebels here uh, trying to fight the empire of, of criminals and terrorists. Oh, I love it, man. You know, I have actually uh, come across one of the night scope. I think it was a K5. I was at the Pachanga Casino in Temecula, California. Oh, yeah. And I'm oh, yeah, we I, saw you there. We knew we know what you uh, were doing. Oh, no, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was so hey, I, hey, know. listen, just to be clear, we work for Big Brother. So obviously, we, yeah. you know, got everything sorted out there. No, no, I appreciate you, man. Thanks for all that. Um, <laughs> hey, so I, I, I just remember I walked in, I was checking into the hotel, just kind of, you know, doing my thing. I was helping uh, support an event down in, in uh, Temecula. It's, you know, I got my bags in my hand, all this. I'm walking to this elevator bay and there's this R2D2 looking thing staring right at me. And it's right <laughs> next to the security booth right there by where that restaurant uh, is by the, by the elevator bay. And I stopped for a second and I'm like, what? what is going on? I thought it was a prop. I thought it was like a, cause I had, I hadn't experienced it. This was maybe three months ago and I turn around and you know, it's quickly, you can kind of see what it is. You know, it's a, it looks like it's policing in some way, shape or form. I look at the security guys and they're like, yeah, I guess cameras and it's monitoring and it's, you know, it's, um, a force multiplier. And I'm yep. like, Oh, uh, okay. And, and I because, left it and because you ought uttered the right code word, of Flight of Icarus by Iron Maiden, we let you continue about <laughs> yeah. on your day. Well, yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, just uh, lay down some Steve Harris bass lines and then, uh, exactly. and then the elevator That's the key. opens. That's the, otherwise, you know, bad yep. stuff happens. So, you know, I, I, uh, I didn't give it much more thought than that in the moment. And then, you know, I have an opportunity to, to have you on the show. And then 
all of a sudden I really start reflecting and I spend some time on your site and seeing all the different types of devices uh, that are available and the way that different facets of both private and public sector uh, can use them. And Bill, it's, it's probably a lot better coming out of your mouth, but what the heck is Nightscope? And what, what are you guys doing? Um, and, and how are you um, uh, providing this robotics-based technology to expand police forces and, and keep us safe? Um, so let me, let me start with the problem first and then kind of what we're working on to fix the problem. Okay. And this might benefit, uh, your audience. And I think the problems is, is twofold and it's kind of around math, no matter which way you want to look at it. Um, so our country has an $800 billion department of defense budget. We give the two plus million troops, every level of capability you might ever imagine. You need a new submarine, new jet fighter, whatever it is. There's one person in charge, the Secretary of Defense. Um, there's an innovation process. There's risk capital. Uh, and the widget comes out the other side. It may take too long. It costs too much money. But the soldiers get everything in a theater of war. Um, and so there's a Lockheed Martin, and a Raytheon, a Northrop Grumman to build whatever widget you need. Um, but on our own soil, we don't have that. So there's about a million and a half uh, uh, law enforcement professionals. There's about a million security guards, about two and a half million humans. Um, and the U.S. Department of Justice and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security have no federal jurisdiction over the 19,000 law enforcement agencies and 8,000 private security firms. There's literally no one in charge. Uh, there's no innovation process. There's very li little risk capital. And these two and a half million people get up every morning and willing to take a bullet for you and your family. And we as a country give them the technological equivalent of a number two pencil and a notepad. And, and that has got to stop. Crime and terrorism has a $2 trillion negative economic impact on the US every single year. And um, so that's part of the first math problem. The second math problem is, okay, you have two and a half million humans trying to secure 332 million Americans across 50 states. You can't triple shift the human. So if you want to run 24 seven at any given time, you got to divide by four because you need four humans to do that shift for the entire week. Um, so there's 600 plus thousand uh, humans uh, trying to secure millions and millions and millions of people across a massive country. And then we're wondering why it doesn't work. And the country's over 200 years old. We're on a 46 president. No one's fixed the problem. And so we decided 10 years ago that we need to go build some new tools uh, and technologies to give those officers and guards really smart eyes, ears, and their voice on the ground in multiple locations at the same time. And what we want to do is put a, a million of these machines across the country um, that could help those 600,000, right? And now you've got a chance to actually uh, fight crime with uh, advanced technologies that combine uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, autonomy, and electric vehicle uh, capabilities all in one kind of crazy portfolio of, uh, of capabilities that you started seeing. Wow. And so examples of uh, these devices, I'm, I'm seeing kind of like security cameras, and I saw that R2-D2 robot looking thing, but maybe maybe take me through the products that have come out of this hypothesis. Um, so the K5 is one of our most popular uh, machines. It's it's five foot tall, uh, three foot wide, 400 pounds. And similar to a security guard, a security guard is only, you know, intended both contractually and, and in a lot of states, I think, I think 17 states legally required to only observe and report. They are not to put their hands on anybody. And so the machines basically do that. You've got uh, high definition, 360 degree eye level view of the area. So um, when you're in the user interface on the software side of things and you put it in full screen mode, you feel like you're inside the robot. It's a little weird. Um, and you can patrol basically remotely. Uh, the officer can speak through the machine. Um, you can have a two-way human to human uh, call. You can detect a person autonomously or automatically. Um, say it's 2.22 in the morning, you're trespassing, you know, we're calling the authorities. Uh, you can run a thermal scan in the environment. The machines can read several hundred license plates a minute. You know, the list goes on and on and on. Um, 
And so that's the most popular one. The K3 is an indoor version. We've got a, a huge slew of uh, K1 stationary machines. Uh, we bought a company last year, Case Emergency Systems. So between the robots and the stationary uh, K1 portfolio, we probably have more than more than 7,000 uh, devices all across the country and, and growing and growing. Where has been um, the, I guess, the most saturation for um, the purchase of these right now? Is it cities and municipalities that are buying these things? Is it a private business? Like who's most interested as this is, has been rolling out? Hmm. I give you two different answers. So first, criminals and terrorists can be anywhere. So long-term night scope needs to be everywhere, right? And securing the U.S. federal courthouse um, is different than securing the underpass of a bridge is different than securing an airport, right? Um, where we've had a lot of initial traction, um, it's probably around a, a half a dozen plus or minus uh, verticals, I'll say. Um, and if you go to, if you go to nightscope.com, you can kind of check out, uh, the entire list, but it ranges from, if you click on what we do, um, it ranges from airports to, um, commercial real estate, corporate campuses, some residential schools, manufacturing facilities, a lot of casinos, um, and a lot of hospitals. And you got to remember they're, they're running 24 seven. Um, but basically anywhere you might see an officer or guard patrolling is, is certainly an opportunity for night scope. Now, um, we, we were joking around a little bit earlier uh, on the show. A lot of truth is said in jest, though, when you say, hey, this is Big Brother, the robots are coming. Um, I imagine just the day to day person, small town Idaho guy like me grew up in, by the way, I grew up in, in uh, rural Alaska as well. Right. So oh, <laughs> I'm, I am, a, I'm a small town person, open-minded, obviously, when it comes to technology and in, in the way that the world that we live in evolves with technology. Um, but what's some of the objections that you've had to handle specifically around the perception of the products uh, that, that are coming into market? Um, I give you the answer maybe from a different angle, which is, you know, I think Hollywood has done us a service and disservice over the last 30 years. Minority report is the first, yeah, the, the first expectation yeah. of what robots can do is up here somewhere, you know, realities like down here somewhere and, you know, put a lot of fear uh, into folks, but Given our experience over the last 10 years, we've now operated over 2 million hours across the, the country. Uh, you know, we've learned a thing or two. And it, it comes down to this, um, you might find it humorous, but some level of uh, being cordial, uh, introducing yourself makes a massive difference. And this is from firsthand experience. If you go put one of these robots in uh, an apartment complex in in Idaho or residential kind of suburban um, sub subdivision or something, and the property manager or HOA or the apartment manager doesn't explain it to anyone, just puts it there and starts roaming around, like you're going to have a problem. Yeah. Because uh, everyone's going to be freaking out. The robots are here. They're coming to kill us. They're going to take everyone's job, this, that, and the other thing. However, if you take a little bit of, uh, I don't know, Southern hospitality or just being polite, if you gather the residents, the tenants, the employees, the students before the robot shows up and says, um, here's why we're getting this technology. This is what it does. Uh, would you like to help name the robot? Uh, would you like some robot cake the day it arrives? Um, would you like a meet and greet and some robot selfies? And this is what the technology does. And, you know, here's the team to talk to you about it, you know, all in favor. I, right. But you have to communicate. And that's one of the reasons I'm sitting here talking to you, Jake, is you know, when, if we want to get the country to change and reimagine public safety, you, you can't just kind of just show up and ram it down someone's throat. You need to kind of communicate let people understand why it's here, what it does and doesn't do. Uh, we don't work for Big Brother. Uh, the data contractually 
um, is owned by our clients, not by us. Uh, all the machine health data and that sort of stuff is owned by us. But, um, you know, the, the, the security related footage and what have you is owned by the client. Yeah. Uh, we may use it from time to time with their permission to improve our algorithms or, or what have you. But, you know, we're not aggregating everybody's data and like um, going to sell it to somebody or something like that. This is our, our mission is to secure the U.S., um, and we need to get society to better understand that technology can be extremely helpful. And I don't believe the founders of our country ever expected us to build a society where going to work, going to school, or going to a movie theater, be it rural, suburban, or urban, came with the risk of literally being shot or killed. And this nonsense has got to stop. Yeah. No, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, from that sentiment, surely there is uh, violent people in the world, people with with malintent. Um, I, I guess one of the things I'm interested in is, you know, you talked about thermo scanning on these things. I'm going to kind of dive in a little bit. So if if you could take a temperature of an individual who's walking by, does that count as health data for that individual? Uh, so no, you call it not. I mean, there's ways to do that, and we we kind of worked on it uh, during the, the height of the, the pandemic. Um, it can be done, but it's it's not as accurate as you would want it. You need to have the individual stand at a certain uh, for amount of time. I mean, it's, it's not as practical as, as yep. you want it. The thermal scan uh, often can be helpful on forensics if you want to go back in time and um, or um, it maybe uh, I'll actually two examples. Just it's, uh, one was you know safety related, but a little bit different. Uh, one of our commercial property uh, owners uh, clients were basically like uh, we kind of flagged to them, hey, that pipe is getting hotter every week. Really? You might want to take a look at that. And it turns out we I think saved them probably north of seven figures from a massive amount of damage that could have happened. Uh, Second was at, a, I think it was a mall. Um, the guard didn't catch it, but, you know, we caught that, and this sounds a little silly, but, you know, the little kiosks in the middle of the mall? Yeah. Well, someone left a curling iron underneath something on. Um, kind of would have caused a lot of fire damage if we hadn't caught it. Uh, or uh, there was a suspect at a healthcare facility who was... Um, harassing an individual, a nurse. And um, when the team went to go do the forensics, uh, he was like, nope, uh, I've been upstairs all along. No idea what you're talking about. You know, whatever. Is this your car? Yes, it is. Run the thermal scan. You want to explain to us why the engine's hot? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, so part, part of this is Long term is we need to get those million machines that we hope to put up, put out over time to be able to see, feel, hear, smell, and speak, and do a hundred times more than a human could ever possibly do. Uh, we do that. Now you're cooking with gas, and now you've got a a a, a chance to make a big dent in the problem. Sure, sure. The, the, the next logical question here well not maybe not the next logical but i'm about to make a big jump i guess uh is you know we see other countries specifically uh, china for instance uh who have enacted things like a social credit score system that's heavily enacted via surveillance and i think one of the uh you know a fair question is could the devices that are being put out over you know a million plus devices that that's the goal of this persistent organization nightscope to put out there be utilized to help calculate social credit scores for individuals um i think there's there's two angles to think about uh the first angle remember what i just said the security data is owned by the client not mm -hmm. by us, right? So Lowe's um, on the retail side is a client of ours, big publicly traded company uh, in home improvement. Uh, PG&E, a big public uh, utility, uh, same thing. Um, you know that that data is owned by them. ABM, big um, parking facility, uh, parking and facilities management firm, also publicly traded. Um, that that data is theirs. 
So it's not like we're calling up Lowe's and pg e and going like, let's go cross-reference all the data. So like, you know, we did this on purpose so that when we have this conversation with you and the audience is listening, they're like, oh, you know, they don't work for the federal government. They don't work for the state government. They don't work for the local government, the corporate campus or whatever. Uh, they do work for them, but that data is, you know, segmented uh, across. Um, I think that's one way to think about it. I I would say that long term, there there might be a different angle. And what pains me is to have the nation's one of the top law enforcement agencies like the FBI pleading with folks on social media to go find a suspect. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, you got your 10 most wanted for the month or whatever it is. And what if we were able to build enough technology and with our clients consent, go, I, I'm making this up, but a, a check box. If uh, FBI requests most wanted, are we okay to use uh, this to go find that suspect that just, you know, did some terrorist action or whatever. And what if night scope could find uh, nine out of 10 most wanted suspects for the FBI. Like, do we want to do that or not? Right. right. So this, this is where the, the comp, that's why the conversation needs to occur. You can't be, we can't use technology. You can't do anything privacy. And oh, by the way, we operate in public. So the concept of privacy is kind of a little odd. Like we're not in the restroom. We're not in the conference room and we're not in the bedroom. Um, right. but you can't go so heavy handed, right. Um, that you scare everyone away and then everyone's kind of freaking out. And so you got to kind of thread the needle a little bit and be in the middle, communicate, but you got to deliver results. Right. Um, I remember when we first announced this back in 2013, there was, a analyst, I think in DC said, you know, something to the effect of. You know, this is exactly the type of surveillance, uh, surveillance that puts people on edge. And my answer to him 10 years ago, my answer today is still the same. You know what puts people on edge? Getting shot at. Yeah. That's what puts people on edge. And so you can't, it's, the world is not black and white. You got to think through the whole thing and be thoughtful about it. Um, and, you know, it's a difficult conversation, but okay, Jake, just for a moment, let the crazy founder go. All right, we achieved our mission. Like just, just for thirty sure. seconds. Like, yeah, yeah, no, no. We make we made the U.S. the safest country in the world. Talk to me about property values. Talk to me about the impact of insurance rates. Talk to me about um, the volatility of financial markets. What about a municipality's budget? What if we could save that trillion or two trillion every year? and dump it into education. You know, do we want to have this conversation or not? Right? And we're just burning cash every year, tears, blood every year, and we get nothing out of it. Do you want to fix the problem or not? Because I can tell you the state and local federal government, as much as I love our country, is not going to fix it. Why can I say that? Well, I've got 200 plus years of data to show you that it right. hasn't been fixed. Um, so that's why we need to get as many people uh, from every angle on a massive cross section of society to support a massive change. And this could come from CEOs and community leaders to healthcare administrators to students and teachers and everything else and everyone in between to go, all right, well, I, I thought you said in your organization, your people are the most important asset you have. Well, if that's the case, can you explain to me why you're not using the most advanced technology to keep those people secure and safe? Like that's the really hard conversation I'm gonna have and continue to have with leaders uh, for the next decade or two to make sure that they can answer that question in the affirmative. Yeah, I, I, what, as I'm listening to you, I think one of the challenges that I still personally have uh, with some of this is, man, I really wish that I trusted corporations and government. 
I just, I really wish I did. And, and over the last five or 10 years in the same kind of time span that we're talking about, it's like, I've seen more whistleblowers coming out. Even recently, there's the, the recent whistleblowers, um, you know, talking about all these things that, that our governments and, and corporations kind of collude fair, around. Fair, and and fair so point. like, I, I so, think so who, who, so who owns Nightscope? Let's talk about or, that. Again, it's what, what you do. How, how did, how did we build Nightscope? <laughs> I don't know. Let's go through the last 10 years. It's not backed by a bunch of VCs, PE shops, and and hedge funds. You know who funded this? 35,000 investors from all walks of life across the country. That's who funded this. Mm -hmm. So it's society that funded this. You know, there are mayors that are investors of ours, judges, former NYPD detectives, FBI, CIA, DHS students, uh, parents. I mean, there's kids that lobbied their parents to buy shares. Yeah. Um, there are bus drivers, municipal workers. Um, there are real estate folks. There are vice presidents of leasing from major corporate. I mean, it's literally a cross section of the, of the country. And all I'm saying is suggesting is if 35,000 people decided to literally write a check, um, Maybe there's some accountability here. And now that we're publicly traded, you can see it. It's still 90, 92% owned by retail investors. Um, I'm accountable to all those folks, right? Wow. So I'm like, I got to be able to look someone in the face and go, yep, we said what we're going to go do. And, and we did it. I, I understand your point. Corporations yeah. have their own uh, kind of weird angles and stuff happens and the government does weird stuff, but I, I think we have a shot to fix a massive problem. And I think it's our duty to at least try really hard to force a victory. And I, I love the persistence, man. That's one of these things that I, I have on the, the podcast all the time is mindset folks like yourself that are like so deeply ingrained on a mission, usually an altruistic vision uh, to, to change the world. Or, or you got to screw loose to be doing oh, yeah, this. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> You know, you, you talked about the the genesis of the com company being in around 2013 timeframe. How has how has the perspective of Nightscope changed in those 10 years? Like, are you still on track to set out to do exactly what you thought it was going to be in the same way? Or has it really kind of evolved with, with some of the um, um, product development and uh, I guess market realities uh, as, as you've been coming to market? Well, Jake, um, you know, everything went according to plan uh, down <laughs> to the minute. Nothing went wrong. Uh, we nailed it. Nailed it. And everyone should do it because it's super easy. You know, we just, yeah. you know, download everything from the cloud. Yep. And everything just appears. Uh, um, totally loaded question. I get it. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I mean, I, I told you, I, as long as I can legally answer it, most likely I will. Um I think there's two angles and it, it oscillates for me. Some days I wake up and I'm beyond frustrated to the nth degree. What is taking so long? Why is this so hard? Why don't people get it? We've made a ton of progress. We've generated millions of dollars of revenue. Um, we built some profound technology. We've got clients renewing like for the seventh year we've done a bunch of crime fighting wins. Why isn't this all across the country, right? And then some days I wake up and like, how the hell did we get here? This is technically speaking, extremely difficult. Yeah. So if you didn't catch the Bloomberg article from, I don't know, maybe two or three months ago, you know, it's over a hundred billion dollars has been invested in self-driving autonomous technology, uh, 200 plus companies working on it. Their collective revenue, close to zero, if not zero, right? So maybe if 200 teams and $100 billion went into a sector and nothing came out other than what we're kind of doing, plus or minus, like maybe it's hard, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that puts things in, in perspective. Um, and in a lot of cases, you know, you got to pinch yourself. Um, we worked so hard for 10 years. And if you didn't catch it last week, we had the Robot Roadshow in Times Square, uh, you have the mayor come out uh, for New York City and, you know, basically uh, give us a contract, 
to help reimagine, you know, public safety in New York City. And, you know, what I told the mayor was, um, you know, I want to make uh, my team and I are working really hard to try to see if we can make the U.S. the safest country in the world. And he didn't flinch. He goes, well, that needs to happen, but we need to make New York City the safest city in the country. And, you know, you, you get a leader like that who was former law enforcement, understands the city very well. Um, the the pluses and minuses, and then you have the entire NYPD brass uh, show up and be there for three days. Like, I mean, my team was in tears. Um, so if you get to you get that kind of validating point um, and understanding that the largest city in the country uh, with the largest law enforcement agency at the at the uh, at the city level. Um, wanting to utilize your technology and they have um, some issues and opportunities where we can be uh, pivotal. Like was the 10 years worth of work getting here worth it? Yeah. Man, last week it was worth it. I'll tell you. No, I, I did catch uh, what was going on uh, in New York and I did some digging as well. Uh, and and by the way, um, let me just say like, what a, what a cool victory to have so many people supporting. Jake, we got a police escort yeah. for the robot roadshow into town. Yeah. I was speechless. Yeah, that's that's uh that's a wild. That's that's gotta be probably on the Mount Rushmore of accomplishments thus far for Night Scope. Oh yeah. Absolutely. I that's mean awesome. that was just and and you know, we're gonna deploy here hopefully during the, the second quarter. And the robot's not even there yet, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so th this is going to be interesting learnings uh, for the city and and the department and for us. Now uh, I know you, you know we we got to kind of bifurcate here the the public sector versus the private sector. We talked a little bit about some of the things that the private sector, you know, they, you know, obviously they're not they they couldn't issue tickets for instance. Like I look at things like the Criminal Justice Reform Act that that New York passed, basically uh, for folks listening. Um, it, it basically for things like noise violations, loitering, uh, public consumption of alcohol, urination, it allows officers to issue a civil summons as opposed to a criminal summons, which is basically, you know, the equivalent of, of basically kind of getting a fine. I mean, you still should show up to court. If you don't show, you end up paying a fine. Is there any discussion about, you know, streamlining the adjudication process through technology like this? And from the standpoint of, you clearly have someone on video. They clearly broke the law. You know, there's a lot of inefficiencies in the court systems. Is that one of the things that some of these cities I mean, like New York might be interested in? For a lot in? of for a lot of cities, um, you know, that already exists, right? You um, you know, you're speeding and you're passed through a certain area, you, you get an automated ticket. Like that's not that's yeah. not new, right? Um you know, we do read license plates um, over time. We need to automate a portion of public safety. The country can't afford to just keep adding more officers and more vehicles and more guards. Um, so just think about it. Just to give uh, folks a perspective, if you want a patrol vehicle to run around 24 seven in a city, um, if it's a rough part of town, you might run two up, meaning two officers, right? Um, so if you're going to do that, I told you earlier, you can't triple shift a human. So if you want to cover the 168 hours that week, you need actually four humans, right? But if you're going to run two up, uh, in a, in a patrol vehicle, that's eight humans plus the pension liability, the time off and the insurance and whatever else goes along with it. Um, plus the vehicle that needs to run 24 seven plus uh, the fuel and maintenance and service and support. You add that all up, just for one vehicle to run two up 24 seven in a city is over a million dollars a year of cold, hard cash, right? And you start thinking, um, and some folks get frustrated with me when I start talking in decades and they're like, no, it needs to happen next quarter. It's like, guys, you, you know, Problem's been festering for 200 years. You want me to, my team and I, just to fix it over the over uh, 90 days? Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but we're going to continue to have a conversation about decades. Sure. Um, I'm highly confident 
with the right amount of resources, could we build something that does not cost the city a million dollars a year? Yeah. Um, and over time, I, I hope we are give a chance to do that. But that kind of concept is everywhere uh, where, you know, as, as the mayor and the commissioner in New York mentioned, like everyone's freaking out when fingerprinting came out. Yeah. Everyone freaked out when CCTV cameras came out. Everyone freaked out when the net, you know, is on and on and on. And, you know, we move forward and you communicate, you get results, and then you start building on it. But this happens in society in general. Everyone's focused and freaking out over AI and, and this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, could you imagine the whatever 150, uh, whatever the math is, years ago when the electricity first came out? Dude, I, I think it's the work of the devil. What do you think? Right. You know, like it's, I've seen it kill people. Like we shouldn't touch that. Right. Yeah. But I mean, it's a silly conversation to have today. But in that context, back then, could you imagine like this magical power just goes through wires? I don't understand how this works. And you can actually visualize it by, you know, seeing the sparks and everything else. This is this is some unknown thing that's highly dangerous. We shouldn't mess with it. But, you know, some years pass. People kind of understand how it works. You got to communicate. Uh, provide some value and then move on to the next crisis for the next decade. Yeah. Bill, I got I have one more primary question uh, regarding um, these robots. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, growing and scaling a business like this and maybe how you've changed over the last 10 years uh, as, as you've been in the space. Um, but, you know, the next thing that seems like it would be on the horizon is more than just observe and report type robotics. As in, I've seen videos of some of the Boston Dynamics stuff that they're working on. Obviously, there's uh, all kinds of uh, military applications for robotics that could have some kind of uh, weaponry that would allow it to um, engage in deadly force. Uh, is that a space uh, that Nightscope has explored? Or do you grapple with some of the the moral, uh, ethical, and, and... No, nothing to grapple here. Okay. Uh, corporate policy for Nightscope, bright red line. We are not to uh, weaponize these machines. Is the first point. Uh, second point: If you're serious about the mission and you want to have a serious conversation with serious people, if you want society to trust a new technology, like don't be an idiot. The like, the like, the last thing you need to be doing is tasing somebody. Like this is just common sense. <laughs> oh, come on, man. <laughs> and then third, uh, not to be funny about it, but I, it's truthful. I don't have any engineers on this side that have any interest in being the engineer, the test dummy, or how to go figure out uh, if that works or not. Yeah. Um, we need the machines to do the monotonous and computationally heavy work in climates that probably humans don't want to be, you know, hanging out in the desert in 12 o'clock in the afternoon in Nevada uh, or in mm. Alaska, where you mentioned earlier, yeah. um, and let the humans do the enforcement and decision-making. These are tools uh, for folks to be able to do their jobs, not, um, you know, some night, you know, we operate in society, not on a battlefield, and we need to be able to put some level of intimidation factor uh, of physical deterrence for, for criminals and terrorists. But at the same time, as I often say, you can't scare the child or grandma. Like we need to actually operate in society. Uh, so for us, there's, there's no hemming and hawing here. It's a bright red line, kind of simple answer. Well, Bill, I know coming into this conversation, I may have had a more Hollywood perception of um you know the the long-term impacts of this i am so um relieved 
and what it sounds like the the character of person that you are and how you're leading this company um as well as you know that what the overall mission man i i feel <laughs> again as as i was coming in this i was like I, I man i don't i don't know exactly how this conversation is going to go um but i i think i have a much deeper appreciation for for what you and the team at nightscope is is trying to do uh and you know how it could benefit um you know the the country that we live in i'm interested you've had some really interesting roles uh in some large organizations this one for the last 10 years is has obviously taken up a lot of your life and a lot of your passion and, and bandwidth how have you changed over the last 10 years on this entrepreneurial journey I say this half half kidding, but when we started Nightscope, I was seven feet tall. Now, now I'm four foot nine. Um, and what I often tell founders and, and entrepreneurs, like if you're going to do something like this, 95% of startups fail, you better pick something that you really love, that you are willing to, to fight to the end, down to the bone. Because in order for you to be successful, you're going to have to do by choice, some really risky, stupid, idiotic, dumb, illogical things to make sure you can make it through. And if you're not willing to get up at three in the morning and make that gut-wrenching decision from three awful choices, like you're not going to make it. Um, you know, how have I changed besides being exhausted? Um I don't know, just spur of the moment answer, you know, one of the ways that really tick me off is you say you're going to do something and then don't do it like this is like the wrong button to push with me. And I'm getting probably less and less patient over time, because in a lot of cases, when you're a young startup with 5, 10, 15 employees and someone drops the ball or whatever and didn't do something that you asked, like you can kind of recover. Um but as the organization grows, um, that can't happen. And now we're, you know, we trade on NASDAQ or ticker symbols KSCP. We're a publicly traded company. Like in some cases, if I tell you to do something and you don't do it, like there are ramifications, not for, for the employee or whoever, uh, it could be a client, it could be a supplier. Um, it, it, it can have a dramatic negative effect on the company and the stakes are that much higher. So I, I think I've become a little bit more uh, poignant about yeah. like, I, Hey, you needed to do X and you know, I hate having to follow up um, because I got plenty on my plate, but humans are humans. And, you know, I, I think one thing that I, I say this happened just, but I, I think is probably more serious. Um, everyone's all worried about the AI and the robots. You know, frankly, from where I sit, I worry about the humans. I mean, robots don't, you know, if you look at the FBI crime clock, you know, uh, a violent um, crime uh, occurs every 26 seconds, uh, a property crime every four seconds. No robot or AI was involved in doing that. That's all humans, right? And so, you know, it's going to be an interesting, you know, next three, five, 10 years and how this all unfolds. But we're at, uh, I think at, at the inflection point of people now understanding that this technology can actually be helpful for societies and, and the robots aren't coming to kill everyone and take everyone's job. The robots are already here. The rise of the robots is for real, uh, but they're here to do some good. I love it, man. I love it. I think, uh, God, this has been a uh, a thoughtful, uh, deep conversation. Um, what have I left on the table, sir? What uh, what is something that uh, you wanted to come on today and make sure folks understood uh, about Nightscope and the spirit of this technology uh, that maybe uh, we haven't touched on today? Um, I, I think if you want to learn more, uh, there's there's two uh, avenues. Uh, if you go to nightscope.com slash rise, R-I-S-E, uh, that gives you a good overview of the company. Uh, if it's just starting to learn about how technology can have a positive impact on uh, on the country. And if you want to touch, see, feel uh, the robots, 
we've done now 70, 70 plus tour stops and I think two dozen states. Uh, if you go to a nightscope.com slash roadshow, um, there's this crazy, I call it the affectionately the robot aquarium uh, that's running around the country with a bunch of robots in it. And you're able to come see and, and feel. And this is open to um, the public, to the media, to investors, uh, primarily for prospective clients that you know, we might provide a, a virtual demo or something like that. Some people are tired of getting PowerPointed to death and Zoomed to death. So they actually get to, you know, we drop the pod at their doorstep literally and have the prospective client and all the decision makers come down and come see, feel here. And I, I think the funniest one for me was um, we we're spending a lot of time with the federal government and uh, we dropped the pod at the Ronald Reagan building in Washington, D.C. Yeah, sure. It was the funniest thing for me. It's like some very, uh, not political in nature, but just conservative dress, uh, uh, very professional government officials all come down kind of um, uh, without cracking a smile or anything. You know, 10 minutes in the in the pod, seeing all the robots and everything. And all of a sudden, everyone becomes a kid, like bust out the robot selfie and, you know, enjoying the, the robots. It's just hilarious to watch like human behavior once they get a chance to interact with the machines they end up building some kind of weird emotional bond with them. Um, and, you know, I think for the audience that would like to learn a little bit more, go to nightscope.com slash rise, or uh, uh, you can check out the tour schedule, uh, which we keep up to date uh, to nightscope.com slash uh, roadshow. Well, Bill, I uh, deeply appreciate your time. I know you're a very, very busy man leading an organization like Nightscope. Uh, again, thanks for dropping by uh, the Jake Blanchard podcast. If you're listening in, uh, all the uh, links uh, that were brought up, nightscope.com, nightscope.com slash rise, uh, as well as the reference to that NASDAQ KSCP stock ticker as well uh, are in the notes. Uh, so you can go check out that company and see what they're doing. And Bill, Best of luck to you. Uh, best of luck to your organization. Uh, and uh, appreciate you once again. Thanks, Jake. And as I often say, long night scope and short the criminals. We'll see you on the other side. <laughs> Cheers.